你妈。The Once and Future Nerd, Book One, Princes of Jordan, Chapter Seven, The Last. Douchey domicile. Episode one. Most forests emerge gradually from the surrounding landscape. The white forest erupts from the plains like a volcano from the ocean. The trunks of the whitewood trees grow so close. That a human could barely fit a finger between them. The carpet of razor vine, which coats and connects the tree trunks, stops even that finger from reaching through. Over the years, the elves have worked to accentuate the appearance of a wall. Where the tree bark has been shaved off, the sun glints a blinding white. Elven artists have shaved beautiful patterns and designs into their walls, accentuated by plates of carved silver and gold. The main gate. One hundred feet tall and wide enough for twenty horses abreast, is flanked by watchtowers and parapets. By design, the land surrounding the forest wall is kept barren, so that no approach from any direction can go unnoticed. This morning, a small cart bounced along the road to the main gate as fast as its old horses could pull. The cart was spotted at nine hundred yards by an elvish sentry. At her signal. A bowl-shaped mirror was turned towards the sun, and flashed a message across the sky. Other watchtowers spotted the signal and repeated it. A hunting horn sounded, and every archer on the battlements knocked an arrow. Within the cart, Brennan and Jen clung to consciousness, but just barely. Billy administered to the girl, applying ice to her wounds as best he could, while Nia attended to the old knight. Hang on, Jen. Come on, Weenie, floor it. They're horses. They don't have any pedals. It's a metaphor, crotch hole. No, it isn't. Both of you, be quiet and ice Jen's throat. I need to focus. At least the cart is holding up. Nelson, God damn it! Don't talk about equipment until the job is done. As if on cue, the rear axle of the cart began to creak and groan. In the old times, they used to believe in wood sprites, water sprites, whatever sprites. Where I come from, we believe in fuck up your plan sprites. And fuck up your plan sprites have one sacred, unbreakable law: you do not talk about equipment you're depending on. And if you blaspheme against the fuck up your plan sprites, they will fuck up your plans. I have met sprites of all sorts: river sprites and wood sprites, sprites of war and of love, even one sprite of terrible jokes. I've never met a fuck up your plan sprite, so I cannot tell you if they are real or not. Regardless, some force of nature seemed to honor Regan's augury, as precisely at that moment, the cart's axle shattered entirely. This cart won't make it to the gate. If we take Brennan and Jen on horseback, and the rest of you hoof it the last quarter mile, go. We'll be fine. That same morning in Castle Guernatal, Arline and Gwen lay huddled together in Arline's bedchambers, half asleep and recovering from the previous night's horror. As if she could hear Ricard's screams in her dream, Gwendolyn awoke suddenly. What is it? Frantically, Arline's right hand grabbed Ricard Redmore's knife, surreptitiously stowed under her pillow. Are you all right? With her left hand, Arline stroked her handmaiden's hair, calming her. Milady, have you had a bad dream? Only gradually did Arline's right hand loosen its grip. Maybe can't remember. My poor Gwen, what you've been through. Arlene returned the knife to its hiding spot, and hugged Gwen close to her. I'm so sorry. You know we need to leave here, don't you? But we can't. Why not? Be serious, Gwen. I thought about it all night. The wedding is our best chance, maybe our only chance. You know, your brother's men love their wine. You must know now that I would do anything to keep you safe. I know, Milady. I saw you last night. Who knows what you'll need to do next? But this is madness you're talking about, and likely suicide. I've seen what it's done to you to stay here. How is it not madness to let that continue? How is it not suicide? 
After tonight, we will live in Lord Mooncrest's house. Have you considered that your brother might try to keep me here? I swear to you, Gwen, I would die before I left you to him. That's what I mean. I don't want you to die for me. I want you to live for me. You're speaking in riddles, Gwen. I might not have all the right words, Melody, but you do understand me. You do. Maybe life will be better at House Mooncrest. Will you be happy there? I don't know. You have the most beautiful soul I've ever seen, Melody, And it's been starved and strangled all your life. Gwen put her hand over her lady's heart. I can hear it crying out for help. Can't you? Yes. Melody, look in my eyes and tell me what you think your life will be like at House Mooncrest. With a deep, almost determined sadness, Arlene met Gwen's gaze. Lord Mooncrest has shown me great kindness thus far. Behind Gwen's eyes, her heart dropped, but she didn't look down. But I do not know the man. It was Arlene who looked down. I don't know his motives or desires. I would need to trust him. And if you tell me you do, I will follow you to his house and serve you dutifully the rest of my days. But I don't think you will say that. Gallad and help me, Gwen, I don't think I can trust anyone anymore. Save for you. Then come away with me. And after we left? How would we eat? Sell all the jewelry we can carry out of here? That will last us maybe a year or two? That's longer than we've ever had. That's assuming we aren't murdered and robbed. And after the jewelry runs out, then what? Don't you think I consider this every day of my youth? I thought... Tomorrow's the day I run away, more times than I can count. And why didn't you? I grew up, Gwen. No, Melody. You was just beaten down. That's different. I'm wise enough to know which feelings there's no sense in speaking. There's always sense in giving our hearts a voice. Even if it's just to ourselves. Please, Melody. Especially today. Let's not pretend about anything. There's such terrible anger in me, Gwen. But it's hopeless anger. There's nothing out there for me. No way for a lady to survive except to continue being a lady. Nothing to sell but herself. I would never let you sell yourself. Not like that. But when all's accounted for, what's the difference? That a whore can be free of a man come morning? A lady's husband is supposed to feed her, clothe her, shelter her. And in exchange, she gives him her body, her children. And she's named a shrew if she doesn't give him her heart and mind as well. Good man or not, that's what will be asked of you at House Mooncrest. You know that. Anywhere we go, Gwen, we'll be at the mercy of one man or another to survive. Surviving's not the same as living. This is a world of men. They chart the course of all lives. Then let me be your man. What does that even mean, Gwen? I can do anything for you that a man can. You can't hold lands unless you inherit them. Do you have any noble kin you've neglected to tell me about? I can work. I've been working for you these last ten years, done almost any job you can name. And I can learn any others. I've heard in the cities women can make a living as garbage collectors. Garbage collectors, Gwen? <laughs> Have you forgotten that your parents sent you out of their home to us? That they would rather lose their daughter than see her live the life of a worker out there? I'm sure I've never forgotten that, Melody. And before you say it, I haven't forgotten what that life is like, neither. But that was before I knew you. You know how I feel about you, Gwen. Do I? Or do we hide from each other behind? Proper words for fear of the bastards who run our lives. I... You know that you're the bright spot of my life. That doesn't mean we can live happily thereafter if we run away. I don't care about thereafter. I'd rather live well than long. That's what I realized in that pantry the other night. I'd rather die after one happy week with you then spend the next 40 years slowly watching you die. 
It's one thing to say that, Gwen, but to actually face it. I had three days sitting in a dungeon I never thought I'd leave to think on it. So please, Milady, believe that I know what I ask. Is it ten bells already? God's damn the bells. The bishop will be here soon for the cleansing. The God's damn the bishop. Gwen. Why must our lives be run by everyone but us? I must get ready. I realized something else in that pantry. Gwen closed her eyes as if it would make the next part easier. I love you. Gwen. I I love you the why I was always told I'd love a man one day. I didn't realize until the pantry. But now that I see it, I know I've loved you from the moment I met you. And I'm just as sure that you feel it too. The windows didn't suddenly shatter, but you'd be forgiven for fearing they would under the hurricane force of this elementally simple sentiment. You don't need to say it back. Say nothing for now if you must. But I beg of you, don't lie to me. Grant us a moment of not pretending. I don't know what to call it. I don't know what to do with it. But I know I'm scared of how strongly I feel it. Of where I feel it. Then come away with me. I'll figure out how. Just be ready. Permit us one chance at happiness. They were interrupted by a knock on the door. Gwen, however, would not let off. Her eyes remained locked onto Arlene's. I offered up my life for us without a second's fault. Do this for me. Live with me. If just for a while. Arlene hesitated for only a moment before frantically nodding her head in agreement. A smile overtook Gwen's face as she quickly, passionately kissed her lady before diving away to some chore. Hiding her own smile, Arlene turned and opened the door. At the gates of the White Forest, the approach of two horses was closely monitored by a good dozen elvish sentries, longbows armed. Yelowin and Regan each rode a horse. Jen and Brennan were tied across the horses like sacks. Five paces from the gate itself, Yelowin reined in. Kaas, Yelowin Sim, Keltil Loguel Natal. Thus announcing himself to the sentries, Yelowin dismounted his horse and approached the gate. He maintained eye contact with the nearest sentry and displayed his open palms, fingers splayed in front of him. When the Keltir reached the gate, He extended his hand towards the sharp razor vine which clung to the wood of the gate. In a quick motion, Yelowin drew his palm across the plant, drawing a trickle of blood. The blood dripped off the vine and into a wooden receptacle below. Far above, the sentry peered down through a reed, as if he could somehow inspect the blood through the device. Whatever the sentry saw, it satisfied him, somewhat. He nodded to his comrades. Ligi lo paratia, or kiad lo dim? Oh, sorry. Allow me to translate. Have I not passed the blood trial? Verily you have, sibling woodsman, but wartime protocols are in place. Well, do I know it. But even in wartime, my blood does not change. The forest is my birthright. And yet with children of men do you travel. As the elves negotiated, Brennan, now fully unconscious, fell off of the horse's back. Regan needed all her strength to haul the large old man back up. Uh! Regan, of course, could not understand Hilig, and was beginning to lose patience with their lack of admittance into the forest. Problem? There's no problem. I'll handle it. The elf returned to speaking Hilig. I am a Kaltir. Of course it is with children of men I travel. Of course, but what is their need to enter the forest? Here, two loyal servants of the realm lie, gravely wounded in their attempts to maintain order. Medicine is needed. And those other three walking behind you? Retainers of the wounded. Of hospitality, they are also in need, though less dire. Check with my superiors, I must. To you, I am known, sibling woodsman. The child of Win Lo Dick and Bat Lo Il am I. Yes, to me you are known, but they are not. 
Please, sibling woodsman, much longer we cannot afford. Now Jen began to slip off her horse, her face turning a disturbing shade of blue. Yiluin barely grabbed the back of her shirt to keep her from hitting the ground. No problem? Really? Seems like a fucking problem to me. On my name and my house for their passage, I vouch. Elven culture places a great deal of importance on the concept of family honor. And truth be told, it was quite rare for an elf to risk even his own honor, let alone his family's, for the sake of a human. Despite his surprise, the sentry raised his left fist into the air and flashed a signal with his hand. Open and closed, open and closed, and suddenly a team of elves was pulling at a winch, and the gate slowly, ponderously creaked open. Moments later, the unconscious forms of Brennan and Jen were lifted into the back of a golden cart by six elves dressed in identical silver robes and veils. Regan and Yellowin stood behind, although Yellowin exchanged some final words in Heelig with one of the veiled elves before the cart was drawn away into the forest. What'd she say? They'll be seen by the best physician here. But? She made a point of not promising anything, and she advised that prayer couldn't hurt. Let's go then. Without a second thought, Regan turned to follow the cart, but Yellowin darted in front of her. Excuse you. I must insist that you mind your manners while within the forest. My people will not suffer a daughter of man to profane this sacred place in any way. I know when to keep my head down, okay? I have dignity, not stupidity. Do you know what happened at the gates? You shed blood on that tree and it wasn't good enough for the guy at the door. Seems to me like you weren't elf enough for the elves. This verbal jab may just as well have been a slap. I vouched for your passage on my name and my house. For as long as you're here, your crimes are mine and your debts are my family's. Counter to all good sense, I have staked my family's entire reputation on your behavior so that the children may be helped. Do not betray my good faith or we shall all be truly beyond hope. The elf and the rogue locked eyes, neither one breaking the gaze. The tension was broken, as it often was, by Billy. Yo, w wait up! Where's Jen? Is she okay? I was wondering if y'all ever arrive. Yeah, well I had to stop off real quick and throw your mom the old- <laughs> Regan elbowed Billy in the gut, hard, not once looking away from Yellowin. She raised an eyebrow at the elf, as though asking if he was satisfied, before addressing the doubled-over boy. What's the matter, you out of breath? I thought you'd been training. Come on, Jen's this way. Sometime later, Yellowin found himself in an area of the forest whose name translates roughly to Hospital Waiting Room. Or the name translates more directly to Place of Boredom and Death Stench. But my bacterial compatriots in your realm tell me Hospital Waiting Room is a better idiomatic translation. Like everything else in the White Forest, this room was shimmering. Vials of luminescent liquid lined the walls. Periodically, an elf in silver robes and veil would emerge from a back room, take one such vial, and return from whence she came. Yellowin was conversing in his own language with a high-ranking physician. To give these substances to men yet typical, it is not. There lies the last retainer of a great house of men. No typical mem yet is he. A tremendous price would these fetch in the human realms. Fit to pay it, he does not seem. Known to you my parents are. Repaid will you surely be. It is not as if this medicine grows on trees. Apologies, wise one. It was my understanding that they... <laughs> Forgive this physician's morbid humor. Of course this medicine grows on trees. You see, the elven medicine in question was indeed derived from the sap of a particular tree found only within the White Forest. It did literally grow on trees. This fact, although well known to most elves, was not widely propagated among humans. This was intentional on the part of the elves, although Yellowin only just now noticed the oddity in that. Very clever, Taid. It really, does though, appear- I will expect payment by Moon's End. My daughter has requested that we extend our home so she may have a second playroom of pure whitewood. The medicine may grow on trees, but wealth certainly does not. A short distance beyond the walls of Castle Guernatal, some members of Ardell Redmore's personal guard rode. 
Tied across the back of one horse was a figure bound, gagged, and head covered in a burlap sack. The party was followed by a hunting hound. As they reached a small clearing, the guards called a halt. The guards dismounted and threw their captive none too gently onto the ground. They quickly tied each of the captive's limbs to the saddle of a different horse via a small length of rope. Only then did they remove the sack from his head, revealing Ricard Redmore. Your cousin says he's sorry about your accident. Ricard's eyes widened, but he barely had time to scream. A guard put a wooden whistle to his lips and blew. No sound could be heard by human ears, but the hound heard. The dog went mad, jumping and barking and howling at the sound. The horses, spooked by the hound, bolted in all different directions. Ricard Redmore was torn limb from limb. Nelson stood in a beam of dawn's light dappling through the canopy of the white forest. The boy stood on the porch of a house-sized structure carved into the trunk of an enormous tree. The bark had been stripped from the tree, exposing the shimmering flesh below. The effect was as though tiny pinpoints of light shone throughout the trunk of the tree. The effect reminded Nelson of something he called Christmas lights, although the effect was entirely natural. You should get some rest, you know. Nia emerged from the structure and joined Nelson outside. Tried. Couldn't sleep. Nor could I. Elven medicine is second to none. They couldn't possibly be in better hands. Rather than looking the cleric in the eye, Nelson found some twigs that had fallen onto the railing which surrounded the patio. He attempted to arrange the twigs as he spoke. I haven't slept well since I've been here. Dreams are really intense. Oh? I mean, I still don't remember them, but when I wake up, I feel like I just went through a lot, you know? And you have no recollection as to the content of these dreams? How about you thoroughly examine these nuts, you tree fart? The door of the tree structure opened again. Billy emerged this time. And by emerged, I mean was hoisted into the air by two elves in silver veils and thrown out the door and onto his backside. For the last time, would you please mind your tongue? Some assholes in there taking Jen's clothes off. They're doctors, Billy. I don't give a shit who they are. Do you understand that Jen would certainly be dead without the help our hosts are giving us? Yeah, but they don't have to be so fucking douchey about it. This place is, like, off a little... It's exactly like I expected it, but then not. Of course you had ideas about what magical tree forts would be like. No, it, it's kind of like Rivendell. It's the, the badass, mystical elf city that we had to ride to for safety, but Elrond in Lord of the Rings is just like the coolest dude. Everyone here is all beautiful, has bitchin' armor and all that, but they're just, well, douchey. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. My bacterial friends tried often to explain to me how exactly the elves of the White Forest resembled a feminine hygiene product from Billy's realm, but understanding long eluded me. Yet, somehow, the children all found this description quite apt. I'm going to see if the physicians can tell me any more. Try not to get us thrown out. Hey man, I, I meant to tell you. You stepped up with me back in that church place. That was pretty legit. I mean, right before we got our asses handed to us? It's like Coach always says. You don't ever complete 110% of the passes you never throw. It doesn't, it doesn't really, uh... I know, man. I, why'd I ever respect that guy so much? He was a fucking moron. From within the structure, a noise emerged that could only be General Brennan awaking. The children rushed into the building. At Castle Guernatal, Antonin Mooncrest held council with his uncle Julius in a room which had been co-opted as a sitting room for the Mooncrests. The Mooncrest sigil had been hastily strewn about, next to the more permanent Guernatal markings. Perhaps Lord Ricard truly is ill. I think it's more sinister than that. You can tell when Redmore thinks he's being oh so clever by the way his lip twists up. The idiot. It may be time then to reconsider your designs, nephew. Whether Lord Ricard is gravely ill or his cousin sent him away, we've lost our best source of reconnaissance in House Redmore. All the more reason to act. 
If Ardell discovered that Ricard was acting on our behalf, he may try to move against us. No, he won't. He needs our army. There's no way around that. Antonin Mooncrest, Arlene Redmore's betrothed, you recall, stood and paced the room. When we embarked on this course, I expected to find Ardell Redmore petulant and uncouth. Instead, I found a man so abject that his mere existence shook me to my soul. When our forebearers were granted lands, they swore to protect the innocent, same as Redmore's. And here is this man who poisons the world with every breath he draws. We are honor-bound to stop him. You've a noble heart, nephew, but you must be pragmatic. Redmore needs our armies, but we need his allies at court. Allies that are only his to give because Gunther is killed. Galden help me, uncle. It wouldn't shock me to learn he had a hand in that. Then prove it. If you can turn his allies to ours, you have my blessing to seek satisfaction from Redmore. Until then, we must tread lightly. Traft wants nothing more than for the princes of Jordan to tear each other apart until none can stand against him. And if you think Ardell Redmore is abject... I worry for Arlene. What of her? I'm worried her brother has yet more cruelty in store for her. Today? On the day of her wedding? Today especially. He won't risk doing anything to embarrass us. My concern is not for reputation or propriety. Well, it should be. Many would call it improper for a second son to run a great house while the firstborn yet lives. Watch yourself. I mean no accusation. You know I've supported you all along. But that's precisely my meaning. There's proper... And there's just, and sometimes they're at odds. You don't need to put on airs about justice. Every man's been tempted to impropriety by a fine piece of ass like Maid Redmore. But that's but not- But we have a realm to think about. A thousand, thousand subjects. Yes, uncle. And the moment we start thinking of our subjects as pieces on a game board is the moment all is lost. In the white forest, Brennan sat up on his infirmary couch. He was drenched in sweat, but it was clear his fever had broken, thanks to the miracle of modern elven medicine. Morning, beautiful. How'd you sleep? What about Jen? Give the salve a moment. As if on cue, Jen awoke, <coughs> coughing. <coughs> Billy was immediately by her side, engulfing her in an embrace. Holy shit. I thought I lost you. What's... where am I? Some elf house. He kissed her. You're on the home of the great physician called Ba'anir Lik. One more on that one? To whom we owe a debt. Which I swear on my title we shall repay as soon as we're able. Just then, the physician entered the room. He addressed a question in Hilig to Yiluin. But Nia responded in kind before Yiluin could. The physician seemed both shocked and saddened by her answer. Nia, mem yet. With something like affection, he traced a circle in the air around Jen and then exited the room. What was that about? He was troubled by the injuries on Jen's neck and wished to learn how she came by them. At which time I informed him that Jen had the horrid misfortune of facing a Templar of Discord in combat. I don't remember that. Did I lose that much time? You must have. I remember the night. We all witnessed that, yes? Jen's fight with the Templar? Spooky motherfucker came out of nowhere. While he was occupied with Jen, I loosed a shaft into his back. Mm, I don't know. Pretty sure I got him with a razor star. I hear Winnie put shafts at a lot of dudes from behind. Jen still looked disoriented, but the rest of the party appeared to have understood Nia's meaning sufficiently for the cleric to drop the subject. Except for Billy, of course. He was still fixated on Yellowin's shaft. Kaltir. When do you think we can get an audience with the High Council? I've already made arrangements. They've agreed to hear us on the midday of the morrow. Billy, already bored with that brief, brief discussion of politics, had turned his attention back to Jen. Their intentions turned very immodest very quickly. Sweet. So what's the rooming situation? Keep your batter in the pan there, little pony. If I may, I would advise we rest meanwhile. Safe haven after a trying ordeal is a blessing most old soldiers dare not hope for. Praise Galadon for that. You look like you haven't slept yourself. Of course I have. What do you think? I just waited in here all night? She had. You'll want to be well rested for the council meeting. And why's that? Why, that's where we'll declare your regency. Shh! Did that fever fry your brains? What the fuck are you trying to do? Regan's face showed the expression of a cornered cat 
Brennan's and Yellowin's simply confusion. Was that not our plan? It wasn't my plan. What about all we said of destroying bad men? That's the kind of shit you do from the shadows. Walking into a room full of elves and telling them I'm queen in the middle of a civil war is a whole nother level of attention. Best case scenario, they believe us and now we've got every standing army in Jordan up our asses. But we'd have the Tar Lohil on our side. Worst case scenario, they think we're full of shit and put us all to death for it. Your claim is just. You've the high throne in your blood, not to mention the Guernotal talisman of dominion. All that proves is I'm a bastard and a thief. You have more than a day to think on your course. In the meanwhile, there's something else. What's that? Yellowin hesitated. His usual confident demeanor was lost for the first time in Brennan's memory. Sir Brennan, have you ever been honor bound to do something that you found very distasteful? Every man has in his time. And yet there's no choice at all, in fact. For to forsake duty would be tenfold more bitter. Very well said, Cartier. What are you bound to do? Since we're here and you're my guests, I'm afraid we must dine with my parents. The home of Wien Lodiek and Bart Lo Yil, the parents of our dear Yilloween, were simply opulent. The mansion was carved into the heart of one of the largest trees in the White Forest, the trunk hollowed out to create a living space. As such, Every surface shimmered and glowed in the manner of the white forest as a whole. The great room in the centre was tastefully decorated, but in a way that the family's wealth and prestige could not be ignored. An entire taxidermied elephant sat in the corner. Paintings by the most famous elven artists adorned the walls. A mahogany table sat in the centre of the room, the dark wood even more striking in the context of the white forest. A massive crystal chandelier hung from above, and precious jewels of every kind accented everything. Yellowwind's parents sat at a smaller table in their foyer, as a small army of human servants buzzed around in preparation for the upcoming meal. Sapphire, you missed a spot on the tusk there. He liberally sipped a brown liquid from a bejeweled chalice. Jade, are you quite sure the roast will be ready soon? Yilouin will be here any minute now. And where is that blasted elder youngling? You worry too often these days, husband. Bart went for another sip, but his spouse grabbed his wrist. And drink too much. Lately I have a feeling, call it a premonition if you like, that everything is coming to an end. I can feel the lights that have shone on Yod and Lo these many centuries slowly being extinguished. It's as if whatever beauty there is in this world is slipping through our fingers like so much sand. That's no premonition, dear. That's just called getting old. At this moment, the massive doors to the hall creaked open. If you ask me, the elves intentionally designed their doors to creak dramatically. It's rather ostentatious. Upon reflection, this may explain Billy's epithet for the elves. While the word may have at some point been involved in feminine hygiene, I, I now agree that the best possible definition of a douche is one with the skill to build quiet doors who makes them creak anyway just for effect. Oh, sorry, I digress. The doors creaked open, and Yellowine entered. He greeted his parents with perfect formality. He stood in the doorway and bowed low before entering and sitting cross-legged on the ground in front of his parents. They in turn responded formally, only briefly touching the top of his head with their right hands. They spoke in Helig. Parents? Youngling. Is not my sibling here? She's only gotten worse since you left. Always off with her friends. Protest this. Delay gratification that. A mere phase it is. You've not been here, child. The youth grow more intolerable each day. When we had your age, we'd pass our summers with harmless orgies down by the lake of homes forgotten. That was a more decent and innocent time. Galadin only knows what they do now. Dark times indeed. And the fall of Gwenatal does little to brighten the forecast. Yes, on that subject... 
Dude. Yo, Weenie's parents are loaded. As you may have guessed, the children had just entered the hall. They did not bother to hide their amazement at the beautiful room, their mouths literally agape in wonder. Brennan, Regan, and Nia did a better job in concealing their reaction, but only just. Jen's joy was tempered, however, when she noticed the stuffed elephant. Yiluin switched into the common tongue. Parents, allow me to introduce my traveling companions. I believe you've heard the name Brennan of Greyfield? Yes, even we elves know that name. My spouse and I welcome you to our home, General Brennan. And I thank you. In fact, he's Sir Brennan Willemson now. Is that a fact? Not it by whom? Yiluin opened his mouth to speak, but Regan caught his eye and almost imperceptibly shook her head in warning. The elf hesitated, and then began again. It was one of the last acts of King Gunther. A blasted shame, that whole ordeal. Yulawain still owes us an explanation as to how that happened on his watch. I assure you, your son executed his duties with great skill and perfect honor. There was nothing he could have done. I'll gladly provide a full account. Yes. Well, it can wait until bread is broken. Of course. And who are these others? Retainers of Sir Brennan's. Nia of Seahold, his chaplain. Honored to be your guest. Margaret of Armstrongard. His arms bearer. And three squires. Jennifer, Nelson, and William. Squires all? Yiluin's father looked curiously at Jen. A moment of uncomfortable tension opened as Regan realized her usual prostitute excuse would probably not help here. The tension was broken, however, by Yiluin's mother. Good. About time they started having female squires. I declare the rulers of Memiet can be positively backwards. The vitality of youth is always refreshing to have in this house, especially in your kind, who are so close to nature. Feel free to make use of the couches in our parlor after supper. I'm sure you all want to copulate vigorously with each other. Uh... As you can imagine, the children were quite unsure how to conduct themselves within the bounds of elven sexual propriety. Why don't we see how we're feeling after dessert? Well, as you will. Shall we? Our supper shall be ready soon. While the party dined like elven aristocracy, the nobility in Castle Gwernathal were preparing for a wedding. Arlene Redmore dressed herself for her marriage. She donned her wedding gown and every item of jewellery she could fit on her body. The serving class of the castle made all necessary arrangements in the Great Hall while a troop of minstrels tuned their harps and lutes. The servants all wore plain brown cloaks with hoods up lest any other maid detract from the beauty of the bride. In this way Gwen was, ostensibly, indistinguishable from all the others. Arlene, shaking with nerves, touched a lonely finger to her lips in remembrance of the past morning's kiss. She sighed and stood, making sure the honed and deadly dagger she'd hidden under her gown was still in place. And so did Galadon decree in the earliest days worth telling. Arlene Redmore and, and Antonin Mooncrest stood before the High Priest world, in the great tabernacle of Castle so Gwernathal. Gwendolyn stood a few feet behind, holding her lady's veil and train. The rest of the court lady was assembled behind them. Arlene, would you enter into that most sacred order and accept this man, Antonin, as your lord and husband, and keep that order pure from any chaos which would sully it in paucity and plenty, in good health and ill for all the rest of your days. Arlene hesitated for just a moment, but then... Reflected in the polished silver of the altar to Galadon, Arlene saw Gwendolyn's face, 
hovering next to her own reflection. She gazed at that face and found it gave her strength. I would. And so the formalities of the wedding concluded in due course, and the celebration began. The newlywed couple sat at a table at the head of the hall. Antonin ate and drank well, but Arlene only pushed the food around her plate while anxiously surveying the dance hall. May I have the pleasure of our first dance? I look forward to it greatly, but pray let me wait a while longer. I was so excited this morning that I could not break my fast, and now I fear the wine has gone to my head. Arlene's eyes searched the hall for Gwen. She was, as I've said, visually indistinguishable from any of the other servants working the evening. But Arlene picked her out, knowing she'd be mingling with the guards stationed by the door rather than distributing drinks to the gentry. You look a mite thirsty, my good man. Well, I certainly thank you, my kind girl. When do you get off duty? Well, I imagine we'll get a few hours leave after the bedding. What about you? What about me? When do you get off? Not nearly often enough. With a wink, Gwen whisked herself back into the kitchen. In the White Forest, the party sat around Yellowin's family table. One seat at the table remained conspicuously empty. That did not, however, stop anyone from devouring the almost perfect-looking food. As he ate, Nelson studied a tapestry which hung prominently on the wall. I see you've noticed our tapestry, young... Oh, I'm sorry. What was its name again? Nelson. Huh? Did she just call Nelson an it? Hilyig does not sex its pronouns. It's a common translation error. That means I know that... what it means. I've done all that stuff. All the sex stuff. I, it was before I knew you, though. I see you've noticed our tapestry, young Nelson. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Not at all. We display it for guests to admire. Well, it's incredible. What are those boats? It tells of the first of our people who found Yolden, the ancestors of all Heliot here today. Heliot? Have you no school in at all, child? It is what we call ourselves. The direct translation in our tongue, Nelson, is wood folk, as compared to us, who are called Nemyet, which means river folk. So you guys aren't originally from here? Oh, Selbrin, no. Our home, Ekas in our tongue is far, far away. The first Heliot of Jordan sailed from Ekas, but were lost in a tempest before making shore. Like a thunderstorm. Something about the mention of a storm caught Jen's attention. Something about the fact that Jen cared caught Billy's attention, so he pretended to listen. Yes, the tales of the thunder are quite vivid. Has anybody ever gone back? <clears throat> Several attempts were made to navigate back to Ekas, none successful. And before long, the ocean farers we came with were lost beneath the sea of the ancestors. And so do all he yet lament the loss of Ekas and honor the memory of home with their art. And so you guys just... Stop trying a while ago? Is there any, like, research or anything that I could... Jen, the loss of home is a very painful memory for the elves. You may ask me what questions you wish at some later time. Forgive her, Taidi. She doesn't mean to be rude. Sorry. I... Thank you for the medicine. Aye, truly, we are forever in your debt. I certainly hope not. Gallant and willing, this business with a throne will get sorted out soon, and you'll find yourself in funds once more. Yes, Sir Brennan, perhaps we could hear more of what transpired. Of course. It began with Ardell Redmore, curse his name and hus. Brennan's story was interrupted by a loud creak. That damn door again. Talum. A young female elf fairly danced into the room. Her face was covered by a dark cloth veil. Ewan, what a lovely surprise. Too seldom do I say it, but you are the best younger sibling. The best. The girl, Yellowin's sister, rushed to her brother's side and hugged him. Yellowin, taken aback by this display of affection, awkwardly patted his sister on the head. Good it is to see you as well, sibling. There are uh, men yet here? 
Don't stare as if you've never seen one before. None of their breed before have I seen. She switched to the common tongue. Hello there. Hi. Sup? What is that cooking? It smells delectable. I swear I am famished. Just as abruptly as she had entered, the girl sprinted out of the room into the kitchen. She didn't let the distance, nor the food in her mouth, interrupt her conversation, however. Mm. Oh, this is amazing. Mm. Would mm. you like us to have Onyx heat that up for you? Mm -mm. No need to trouble the help. It mm. must be cold by now. Mm -mm. Good this way. Sorry, who is that? That is my sibling, Yellow Dick. <laughs> Although they surely could not understand Billy's mirth, Elodic's parents excused themselves from the table and followed their daughter into the kitchen. They spoke in hushed tones, in Hilig. Mm. Mm. What? Veil off, child. No, it's bright in here. Let me see your eyes. <laughs> You've been chewing cannab root with your friends again. So what if I have? Were we not clear about that matter before? We've a mind to send you to bed without supper. I already ate. Enough is enough. You are not to leave this house for a fortnight. Oh, like you don't drink a pint of wood since every evening of the week. You will mind your tongue in mixed company. So now you care what men yet think? I'm surprised you let them in your house, the way you talk about them. You shall sit down, child, and mind your manners or else you shall stay in this house for two moons instead of two weeks. I'm so tired of this. You don't understand me at all. We certainly don't. Now take a seat. The three filed back into the main dining hall. Those who did not understand Hilig were enjoying their meals contentedly. Yiluin and Nia, however, looked sufficiently embarrassed. My elder child apologizes most deeply for her. Tardiness. She had something very important to tend to. Sir Brennan, your tale is interrupted. Would you like to continue? <clears throat> yes, thank you. As I was saying, it began with Ardell Redmore, who... <laughs> Elowin's sister was deeply, thoroughly amused by the patterns formed by swirling the soup in her bowl. Uh, Ardell Redmore who conspired most foully to spread slanders against... <laughs> Yiladik! <laughs> oh, sorry. Dude, Weenie, I think your sister is high as balls right now. He spread wicked slanders against his late majesty, peaceful be his rest, which led the court And what to... was your name, dear? Oh, I'm Jen. Jen? I adore it, so primal. Um... If you say so. Where are you from, Jen? Funny you should ask that, because... Uh, um, fate of the realm at stake, in case you've forgotten. Right, sorry. Redmore's slanders led the court to suspect May I King your hair? Enough to imprison Human hair is just, like, the point of Regent, so exotic, you know? Sure by what uh, so not cool. A point it's like blowing my mind right now. As Brennan attempted to re-repeat his tale, a servant came to the table, handed a scroll to Wien, bowed deeply, and returned to the kitchen. I'm terribly sorry. You'll have to excuse us. Taid Relotit has returned and requests an audience with the High Council immediately. Illowain, I trust you'll keep our guests entertained and your sibling busy. If you've but a moment, I'd humbly request the chance to quickly finish my account. You'll have an audience with the council in the morning, Sir Brennan. This way you need only tell it once. At Arlene Redmore's wedding, Gwendolyn surreptitiously passed a cup of ale to another guard, this one employed by the bride's house rather than the groom's. I will see you later, won't I? She brushed her hand along the guard's shoulder as she returned to the kitchen. At the dais, Arlene took a deep breath and then pasted a smile onto her face and turned to her husband. I think I should very much like to dance now, my lord. The couple joined the dance floor. The dance appropriate for the current melody involved couples frequently switching partners. Meanwhile, 
Gwendolyn had returned to chatting with the first guard of the evening. The second guard, who had been watching Gwen go, couldn't help but notice this. Oi, what do you think you're playing at? Me own business, and I don't play. Arlene had her empty few seconds of conversation with a low-ranking lady of the court. A beautiful wedding for a beautiful bride. Oh, thank you. And just what we needed after all the unpleasantness. The wench is coming with me. That's not what she told me. What was you talking to him for, you tart? I only did because I wasn't sure you were serious. Oh, I'm serious. A number of wedding guests had by this point taken notice of the quarrelling guards. Arlene had noticed as well. In fact, she was watching so avidly that she hardly noticed who her next dance partner was. Enjoying yourself, my dear. What's the matter? Nervous for your wedding night? You should be. You think because of that ridiculous horse stunt your husband will believe in your purity? The song reached the beat for partners to switch. Ardell Redmore refused to switch. He'll know you for the whore you are anyway. He'll know you by the way your gash reeks of wantonness. Arlene furtively reached her free hand behind her back to where she had hidden the dagger. He'll know you as the gods know you. As I've known you since we first bid together as children. Her shaking fingers found the hilt. And he shall loathe you for the rest of your days. Arlene slowly drew the dagger from its sheath. Now get out of my sight. Ardell fairly threw his sister across the dance floor. Arlene caught her breath as she slid the dagger back into its sheath. Meanwhile, Gwen's friends were becoming better acquaintances. Do you really want to die tonight, you pasty shit? Before I thought my cock was hard for her. Now I know it's for killing you. If you kill me, there'll be no one to fuck your mother's ass when she's begging this for This quip was interrupted by a fist to the face. In a flash, the two men were rolling across the dance floor, throwing haymaker punches with abandon. Highborn folk ran screaming in all directions. Other guards around the hall rushed towards the fight. The responsible ones to break it up, the more drunken ones to join in. In the panic, Gwen stole to Arlene's side and threw a plain, rough brown cloak over her wedding fineries. Now indistinguishable from a pair of servants, the two darted away to the kitchen and from there, out into the night. Jen sat alone by a small pool in the white forest, dipping her toes in the water and listening to the peaceful sound of the waterfall. Come here often? Duh! Jesus Christ, we get it, okay? You move quietly. Regan had, obviously, interrupted Jen's peace. I don't know who you've been hanging out with who told you that shit was okay, but it scares the crap out of normal people. No need to be scared. I'm unarmed. Jen raised an eyebrow at the rogue. I'm only lightly armed. May I? Do I really have a choice? I'm making an effort here. Okay, fair enough. Sorry. Regan dropped to her haunches next to Jen. For a moment, the two watched the water in silence. I think we, uh, what's the expression? Got off on the wrong foot. <laughs> what? Did I say it wrong? No, it was right. It's just... You've got a prodigious talent for understatement. The silence returned. Maybe the setting contributed, waterfall and all, but it was an oddly peaceful, companionable silence. Kind of like this spot. It's not bad. You can hear yourself think. And elves can't hear you talk, even better. So, um, what's up? Up? Why'd you come here? Well, I followed you. Not creepy at all. I think maybe I might want your advice. Advice? You want me? My advice. I said maybe. What is that? See, this is your problem. You talk in little, like, riddles or something. I don't do riddles. Not riddles, but like you do this thing where you're the only one who knows what you mean. Maybe that's the point. I know it's the point. I'm not stupid. But you can't ask someone for advice and then have a conversation just with yourself. Queen Regan actually smirked. You know, like a week ago, you never would have had the guts to tell me the terms of our conversation. You know how people try to get you to do something by saying, what's the worst that can happen? Yesterday, I felt myself asphyxiate to death. That's it. That is the worst that can happen. 
everything seems a lot less scary now. I'm more scared of not doing anything. The worst thing I've seen happen to somebody? You know what? Don't need to know. I won't lie. I am glad you survived. Gee, thanks. My point is don't go thinking it means you know shit now, though. You don't. You know, I'm pretty tired of people treating me like that. Prove them wrong. Shouldn't have to. And I should be municipal cunt kiss inspector for free wine city, but here we are. What did you want to talk about? Eh, never mind. Abruptly, Regan stood. Wait, wait, wait. After all that? You don't know anything. You can't help me. What the fuck even are you? Well, I'm not some little girl who doesn't know anything. Hey, screw you, okay? I don't screw kids. Stop that! So you do want me to screw you? Fuck you. Fuck me? Yeah, fuck you! Do you ever shut fuck the me? fuck up? I'm the fucking queen. You're just a stupid fucking girl. Fuck you, stupid girl. What the fuck do you know? Regan was nearly gone from the clearing when Jen, looking out over the waterfall, spoke quietly. I know your cat story was bullshit. A tight smile passed over Regan's face, showing as much pain as gratification. She hid her expression again before returning to the waterside. What was that? The story you told me? Where you were at the orphanage and you had to bury your cat? It wasn't your cat. It was your sister. And what gave you that idea? Your story just never fit together right. You talked about your sister in the beginning, but never said what happened to her. Plus, honestly, I don't know if anyone picks up a sword and starts killing everything because their pet died. A sister, though. Maybe I just really like that cat. When you knighted Brennan, you said your middle name was Margaret. You even used it as your alias with Yellowine's parents. You're Maggie, not the cat. Which would make your sister Katie. I did really have a cat. It really did die. The gods have this great way of teaching you the hardest lessons over and over again. Feel you there. And I really did like that cat. But your sister... Kitty was my soul, I think. Sorry, you didn't kill her. And you just earned a spot in my small council. So, what do I do at this meeting today? Jen, already surprised by Regan's candor, was not prepared for the abrupt change of subject. You mean, do you tell them you're... Shh. Tell them you're the queen? Yeah. What do you think? I think you should do it. Would you? Yes. So we're still horseshitting each other then. I'd want to do it. Whether or not I actually could... I still think you should do it. Why? You can do more good that way. Good? What does that mean? Good for who? Just good. Just regular good. Good for everybody. What's in it for me? That's not why you do good stuff. That's not why you do good stuff. Why should I put my neck on the block? There's a lot of Katie's out there. The more good there is in the world, the more of them get to grow up. It's a nice little thought. But I don't just say I'm queen and then save the world. Even if the elves do back me up, there's a lot of killing between here and the throne. Hasn't stopped you before. Could be me that gets killed. Or you. Or Billy. Since I've been here, it's a rare day anyway when someone isn't trying to murder us with swords. Fun, huh? Oodles. Regan's face again stretched into a crude mockery of a grin, and then she turned once more to leave. Hey. Why me? Brennan's a good man, but he pretty much just does what he's told. I wanted the goody-goody answer, but I wanted to hear the smart version of it. You were testing me before, saying I didn't know anything. Seeing what I do. Lo and behold, my lords and ladies, she grows smarter before our very eyes. Did you think I'd pass? Didn't know for sure. That's why I tested you. Yeah, but, you know, if you were a gambling gal... I think probably I'd have bet on you. Why? I was impressed by your little heist there, where you relieved Jamie McShane of his heartbeat. Jen looked down at the ground, suddenly feeling ill with guilt. That and the, uh, bzz. I'm thinking maybe you're a fighter after all. Not a good one, yet. But you're a lot stronger than you look. I want to tell you something about myself. Why? I'm tired of being scared of it. I want to tell someone. Yeah, but me? <laughs> Trust me, the irony is not lost on me. But I just realized you're the only person who's ever called me strong. All right. Be <laughs> quiet before I wuss out. I was 11 when my dad left. That was right around when I got into cheerleading. 
My mom said it was good for me to be friends with the nice girls on the squad and to have adult supervision after school. Mr. McReary was the junior high cheerleading coach. I guess a coach is like, um... Someone the rules said you had to listen to. Yeah, exactly when you put it that way. He used to watch me in the locker room. He'd keep me back after the other girls had left, give me some two-minute cheerleading pointer that I already fucking knew, and then he'd go, great, you can get changed now. Every time, just like that. And he'd stand in the doorway just to make sure I knew I couldn't get around him. He didn't say anything, but I got it. The best part is, the first time it happened, he actually started by talking to me about my dad and whether I was doing okay. Really thought he cared until... Yeah. I think maybe people knew, but at the same time, no one knew. You know how that goes. Shannon kept making these comments to me like how I got all the attention from men. I think she was actually genuinely jealous. Pitch. What did you want to get from telling me that? You never lived in a small town. Everyone gets so judgy. If you, if you try to tell them that something about their tiny little world is totally fucked, it's your fault for rocking the boat. No one ever said it out loud, but there might as well have been a goddamn billboard on the highway. Don't make trouble, little girl. I just wanted to say it outside of that bullshit. You're a lot of things, Maggie. Regan raised an eyebrow at this new address, but permitted it. But you're not the kind to judge a girl for starting trouble. The two looked out over the waterfall. After a moment, Regan turned to Jen raised a hand, and gave Jen two firm pats on the cheek. This was the most affection Ayurana Regan had shown to any person in many, many years. You should get some rest, girly. Might be I'm going to start some trouble soon. Later that night, a rather drunk Antonin Mooncrest stumbled up the spiral staircase towards his new bride's bedchambers. His journey up the staircase was rather arduous, impeded as he was by the alcohol. He was surprised to see that Arlene Mooncrest, nay Redmore, was not in her chambers. His confusion soon turned to righteous indignation, as his mind very quickly constructed a story as to what became of his wife. Adele Redmore, you son of a whore. On a frosted road southwest of Castle Guernatal, a horse-drawn wagon clomped slowly through the night. Its freight was a shipment of food, all stowed in barrels and sacks. Two armed men rode in front and four more escorted it on horseback. They were all of them clad in the simple raiment of the Civic Guard's freehold garrison. None noticed the well-honed knife that cut through one of the sacks from within. As you may have guessed, this was the knife that had belonged to Ricard Redmore until his cousin Arlene took it from him. As the sun rose above the white forest, Brennan, Regan, Nia and Yellowin found themselves standing in front of the most massive tree any of them, apart from the elf of course, had ever seen. The trunk itself could have fit one of Billy's football fields. The bark of this tree had been replaced entirely with worked silver, carved to depict the great heroes and battles of the elven histories. At precisely the appointed time, the massive doors creaked open slowly. Of course they creaked. Within sat fifteen regal-looking elves, including both of Yelouine's parents. This was the Council of Elders. They were all dressed entirely in gold, not the colour but actual metal. They bid Brennan begin his tale from the beginning. My lords, imagine if you can what life is like for a rabbit. Sorry, it's a very long story. Let's skip to the interesting part. So, left with no other options, his late majesty sought to flee his own house with my help and that of my arms bearer, Margaret. In our attempt, we were beset by many arms in the employ of Lord Redmore. It was one of these men who killed King Gunther, 
Last I'd heard, Redmore was trying to lay the blame upon my arms bearer. The Elven Council, not prone to haste, considered the story. The High Chancellor of the Council, more ancient than any two others in the room combined, sat like a statue, although his eyes were as sharp as a hawk's. Regan, too, surveyed the room with eagle eyes. Every fibre of her well-tempered body tingled, as if she were ready to start a fight with the whole council, or to flee at a moment's notice. Finally, a council member spoke, Yilluin's mother, as it happened. And was the Kaltir to House Gwanatar present for any of these events? For once, the Kaltir Lo Gwanatar looked like a small child being admonished by his mother for playing in the mud. I uh, was not, but I can vouch with the utmost confidence for Sir Brennan's character and his loyalty to the king. Unfortunately, this is one of those rare times when loyalty has dangerous potential. Supposing, just for a moment, that his late majesty did, in fact, have plans counter to the laws of men. Is it conceivable that Sir Brennan would deceive to conceal this? Regan opened her mouth as if to retort, but the old general preempted her. I would do anything for his majesty, but no man triumphs if Ardell Redmore rules. At this, every member of the council turned to the High Chancellor. The old elf remained still as a statue, considering. Finally, his head bowed, barely a fraction of an inch. I think I may speak for the council in saying we are sufficiently dubious of the legality of Redmore's rule. We would endorse any action you take to unseat him. That is most excellent news, Taid. Sadly, as I have said, the better part of my armies has been slain or scattered during Redmore's coup. We had hoped that, given this, along with the encroachment of General Traft into civilized lands, we might humbly plead assistance from the Knights of the Wood. We thought you might. The Council will let the High Commander, Taid Rilotit, speak to that. Gratitude to the Council for the floor. You might recall Taid Rilotit from Brennan's retelling of the time he met the rebel Traft, 16 years prior. The Commander stood, assessing the poor health of her former colleague, Brennan looked as if he had aged 50 years in the past 16. Rilotit, of course, hadn't even aged a knight. Regan marked her very well. If I have understood your testimony correctly, it seems House Gwernatal was indeed gravely wronged when Lord Redmore assumed regency. Not wronged, Taid. Ruined. But it has never been the charge of the Talohil, nor of any elves, to settle the feuds of men. Brennan tried valiantly to hide the disappointment from his face. Of course, Taid, but as we have said, we think the unlawful destruction of my armies, combined with the threat of Traft, creates a... a... Extenuating circumstance. Aye. I'm very sorry about your men, Sir Brennan. I'm certain they were brave fighters who deserved longer lives and more honorable deaths. And we are watching the half-orc carefully. But the concordat is very clear. The Talo heel will not enforce the inheritance laws of men unless there is a viable line of succession. Regan's muscles tensed, nearly imperceptibly. Her eyes scanned each of the fifteen elves on the council, as if searching for some hint of their thoughts. If you were to make us aware of some person of procreative age with some tenable claim to the High Throne, this would be a different conversation. But until then, this is a feud between houses, and we simply haven't the resources to intervene in every one of those. Brennan, in his old soldier's discipline evident, kept his eyes affixed to Commander Rilotit. Nia, however, couldn't help but flick her eyes quickly over to Regan. For herself, Regan's gaze bore into the back of the commander's head. Sir Brennan, do you know of any such person? Fifteen pairs of elvish eyes bore down into the old general's face, which had turned to stone. He was too disciplined to look to his queen, though he was entirely at the mercy of her decision. Irona Margaret Regan studied the room, 
and her breathing slowed. Now, I've friends who are bush sprites in the northern deserts. They had long told me one of the most magnificent experiences in this world is to behold a stalking lioness as she decides whether the moment is right to pounce. An instant too soon and she will be spotted and evaded. An instant too late and the opportunity will elude her. The instincts required to make such a decision are a marvellous, perfect creation of nature. I knew then the awful beauty of which my friends spoke. Regan had reached her decision. She drew a deep breath to speak. For additional information and bonus content, access onceandfuturenerd.com on your computer machine. New episodes are released every other Sunday. The Once and Future Nerd is written and created by Zach Glass and Christian Madeira, and directed and edited by Christian Madeira. It is performed by... Rhiannon Angel. Garrett Arman. Dan Dobransky. Lily Drexler. Anya Gibeon. Ian Harkins. Paul Notice, Frank Quares, Julie Reed, Gregory M. Schultz. It is co-executive produced by Jess Kelly. Alex Story is an associate producer. The Once and Future Nerd is recorded by Brian Forbes at the Gallery Recording Studio in Brooklyn, New York, with additional audio engineering by Sam Palumbo. Foley sound design and mixing is done by Sandra Ramirez. Theme music is composed by Tom Lee. Additional music by Christopher Montalbo. Thanks for downloading. 